today we're very, very excited um, to have Professor uh, Rashid Bashir, um, who's the head of bioengineering and the able plus professor of engineering. Uh, Rashid got his uh, undergraduate degree at Texas Tech before he got his PhD at Purdue. He was, uh, uh, he was briefly at National Semiconductor before he was back at Purdue. And then now we have him here at, uh, at the University of Illinois um, in the bioengineering department. And so Rashid is going to tell us about emergent biological machines and other cool things at small scales. Can everyone hear me okay? Is the mic working? No? All right. How about now? Okay, this one is on. It's just not loud? So maybe someone needs to turn it loud or do I speak loud? All right. Either one is fine. Okay. All right, well, thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it. I know Saturday mornings are very precious, so I really am thankful that all of you are here. And I hope I can keep you all awake and excited through the next hour or however long. I have plenty of time, so I can, and I think I have plenty of slides. So I want to share our excitement with you and the kind of work we're doing and talk about a few related things, research and other outreach and other things. So um, as was mentioned, so actually my training is in electrical engineering. I was an engineer uh, doing semiconductor design, chip design. And then in the last semester of my PhD, I took two bioengineering courses. And I just got completely sort of turned over and said, this is what I should have done. This is what I really want to do. So then when I was working in industry, I went back and took all the organic chemistry, biology, labs, courses, all this stuff, and then went back to academia to kind of try to see if I can find a way to combine those fields, sort of engineering at the micro nano scale, uh, sort of you know, originating from microelectronics and that kind of ideas, along with biology and chemistry, and see if we can merge that and do some cool things and some useful things. So I'll try to show you both, both today. So just very briefly on size and scale, the kind of scale that we are interested in. So on the left here, you have this axis that goes from one angstroms, which is 0.1 nanometer, is one angstroms, right? 10 to the minus 10 meter, all the way up to 100 millimeter, let's say. So most biological things that we see around us are, you know, we call, they are fabricated, quote unquote fabricated, by bottom-up biological processes, you know. And if you look at just roughly, you know, you have the proteins and DNA, you have viruses, you have bacteria, cells, and then on, organs. So that's kind of the size scale. Then on the bottom here, you can also see there's been lots of advances in the last tens of years in sort of what's called chemical bottom-up self-assembly, where chemists have come up with really cool ways to self-assemble structures and a lot of nanostructures like uh, carbon nanotubes you might have heard about, or graphene, uh, quantum dots, nanoshells, nanowires, and stuff like that. And they all tend to be in this sort of smaller, one to one to thousand um, angstrom, so to speak, or ten, <coughs> one to ten, uh, one to hundred nanometers. And then there is the, what you would call top-down silicon fabrication. So the reason that your you know, everybody is now glued to and has this addiction with the iPhones and, and everything, and I hope nobody will, of course, use it during this time, right, this hour. But, uh, but the idea that you can actually uh, now have, you know, almost these supercomputers in your palm, and that's because of this top-down fabrication, where today in semiconductor industry, Intel and Motorola and these companies can make structures that are 12 nanometers on a 12-inch wafer. So it's pretty amazing how small features. But you have these whole systems that are fabricated in electronics and silicon and um, metal and different. So our goal really is to kind of see if we can find a way to benefit from all these fabrication technologies and build new things. And then also there is this new, uh, a big resurgence in 3D printing, right? Everyone must have heard about 3D printing now. And 3D printing tends to be at this point sort of, you know, micron scale. It's probably kind of aggressive a little bit for 3D printing, but there are, and we have been doing that in our lab. And then all the way up to centimeter and larger scale, right? And 3D printing really kind of came about from automotive and manufacturing industry, and now is being applied to lots of things. So this is a busy slide, I know, but there's a, you know, that's kind of the, we are, we are interested in a lot of these size scales and fabrication methods, and using that to see if we can do some interesting and cool things. So uh, in my lab, we, like I said, we do lots of fabrication. We like to build things in silicon, plastics, and, material, and, and other materials. And then we apply them to grand challenge problems. So we are very interested in diagnostics for global health and food safety. I'll show you actually a couple of very quick examples of that. 
We are very interested in cancer and individualized medicine. How can you apply these technologies for detection of cancer and early detection of cancer? And then what the main um, topic today is this idea of uh, 3D biological systems and biological machines. But I want to show just a couple of slides here to kind of also motivate the other, other work. So um, a few years ago, I did a sabbatical at MGH and met with some wonderful people. And uh, this uh, so Bill Rodriguez is an infectious disease physician, and he said, you know, can we detect HIV from a drop of blood? And how can we do that? So we came up with, with another uh, bioengineering expert, Mematoner at MGH. We came up with this technology that is what we call a point of care sensor, a point of care, which is also called lab on chip, where you're trying to bring the entire operations of a lab on a chip. And the idea is to take a drop of blood, put it in a cartridge, and be able to detect and diagnose disease from a reader. So the model here is very much the same as what it is for you know, glucose monitoring right, for diabetes, but can we do lots of other things with it? So one example, and actually I can come and give another whole talk on that topic sometime on point of care sensors, but I just want to show you very quickly. So we actually came up with uh, this device, which is really, um, it's a huge problem worldwide, where 33 million people are living with HIV and only about one in eight are able to be tested today. And the key issue is really the diagnostics in very remote settings, very difficult to, to test conditions. So um, we came up with this technology, which is a lab on a chip, we call it. And actually, I brought some samples. I'll pass this around. You can see if you can just pass it around, but I want it back at the end, so <laughs> don't walk away. And you can take it out, you know, hold them with your hands. There's little examples of the kind of devices we make. They're made in silicon and polymer and glass and metal. And um, this is a video of what we can do. Uh, this is a real-time video of whole blood coming into this port. And this chip is the size of a credit card. And this is whole blood flowing in. Two other fluids are coming from the sides that you cannot see but, because it's transparent. But you can see the red blood cells start to get lysed just a couple of turns down this channel. We're looking at a top view, and this is a serpentine channel. And we can actually process essentially whole blood in these chips, the kind of chips that are being passed around. And we can, um, let me just play that again. So we can actually process whole blood at a point of care in these devices and separate, for example, we can lyse the red blood cells and then collect the white blood cells and detect specific types of white blood cells, for example. So these are kind of things that we actually developed. A, uh, there's a company that we started called Daktari Diagnostics. You can look up the web page. All the good stuff and uh, um, wish it well because this is a very critical year. We're trying to release the product and the product looks like this. It's actually um, this uh, small toaster sized instrument with a little cartridge where you put a drop of blood, put it in the box and it detects the specific types of white blood cells in 10 minutes uh, for less than $10. And the goal is to reduce the cost more and there's a whole lot of very, very smart people working on that. We just kind of helped come up with the initial idea and help them, but there's a whole group working on that. And they've tested this in four different sub-Saharan African countries, and it works, so we really hope that will move forward. And since then, we've actually expanded the technology to now do what's called a CBC, a complete blood cell count. So if you, you know, everyone has gone to the lab and gotten blood drawn, and there's no reason why you should have to go to the lab to do that. I believe that's gonna happen, you know, soon enough. It's already starting to happen at pharmacies and eventually at home. So we've expanded that technology to do this complete blood cell count at home. And actually, one of these chips is in this little Petri dish that I'm passing around. So we're very excited about that. Um, another example that I'll give just very, very briefly is uh, detection of cancer. So we have a project with um, a, a group at uh, Mayo Clinic through this Mayo Illinois Alliance. And the idea here is to detect what's called, uh, met <coughs> what's called methylation. Uh, on a DNA, and the methylation is an early, it, it can be uh, early detection for cancer. So uh, this is a DNA, this is a picture of a DNA, and then we attach these proteins, essentially, to those specific uh, points on the DNA, and then we take this whole complex, and then we pass it through a single, what we call a nanopore. So this right here is, of course, an artist rendition, but we can actually drill nanoscale pores, holes, where a single strand of DNA can go through. And as it goes through, we can detect its electrical properties and actually detect the presence of this protein. So we can detect DNA on a single protein, uh, I mean, a single protein on a DNA, and that uh, can be the, how many proteins are attached can be an indication of, uh, of certain types of cancer. So we're very excited about that, and this project is also moving forward. 
Uh, just to show you this picture here, you can, this is actually what's called a transmission um, electron micrograph. And there is a small hole here. You can see this in the middle. And that's 5 nanometers. So this is 50 angstroms. And this is in a semiconductor layer. And this hole was drilled with a very focused electron beam, uh, actually not very far from here in the materials research lab, just right, right here. There's a fantastic lab which has these instruments. And this small hole is drilled, and then we can pass a single DNA through this. So that's the kind of things we can do, and we are very excited about continuing to, to move those forward. But then, as you can see, these things are made in silicon or plastics or uh, metal, things that, that engineers have um, <coughs> you know, designed over many, many years, and things that actually materials that we can predict and we can forward engineer, call it. So, with the existing sort of materials, we can forward engineer the design rules, and you can build things that you like to build. So the question is, can we do that with biology also? <clears throat> right? That's a fascinating question if you think about it. Um, can we build systems with cells? And that's kind of the question here. So can we, for example, take myocytes? So myocytes are muscle cells in our body. And there can be skeletal muscle cells or cardiac muscle cells, for example, cardiac cells or skeletal muscle cells. Um, can you take neurons? And neurons are the basic element of sensing and, and processing information and storing information. And can you take endothelial cells, which actually are the cells that form blood vessels and transport fluid, blood, through to organs to take the nutrients and also ex remove the wastes, right? So if you were to pick just a couple of cell types, those three cell types, can you take those cell types and start to put them together, learn the design rules, and build systems that don't exist today, per se? Right? So just imagine th that kind of uh, sort of in the future. Just like in the last you know, 50 to 100 years, we learned a lot about the solid state materials and how to design with them. So can we do the same thing with biology moving forward? Right? So this space is also called synthetic biology. And people have done a lot of work at the level of DNA and uh, within bacteria. And what now we're trying to do is to move towards sort of other types of cells and larger sort of systems that are maybe millimeter to centimeter scale. OK, so it makes sense? All right. <clears throat> so we actually have a center from NSF. NSF funded the center. It's a $25 million um, over five years. And uh, it's partnership with MIT, Illinois Hare, and Georgia Tech, and other, because this is a very, very complex problem, as you can imagine. It's a very, very interdisciplinary problem. You have to really bring people together from all sorts of disciplines. So in the center, we have people from biology, and uh, like developmental biology, you know, molecular biology, cell biology. We have people f who are mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, bioengineers people who are doing modeling and simulation. So really, all sorts of expertise that comes together. So, <clears throat> so what are biological machines? If you think about biological machines, you might think about things like this, right? So you think about Terminator. And I, I should change this. Now we know there's many generations of this. <laughs> so, uh, but when you think about biological machines, you think about things that are still sort of electronic or metal and other things that, that mimic biology. Or you think about you know, prosthetics. So, very, very important field, right? <clears throat> Where you can maybe build artificial organs that um, also for tissue engineering, for example, but try to build structures and machines and systems that really can also help people that are, again, a combination of electronics and biology. So I'm going to push the limit on trying to see, you know, what can we do with all biological material? It's fantastic. And actually, we're also working on integrating electronics with the biology. But um, Biological machine, and actually, if you look back, of course, the best example of a biological machine is what? Humans. So even philosophers from the past and artists and you know, thinkers have been, talk have been talking about how organs and humans and biology is really the most, sort of, the most advanced form of engineering, if anything, right? Uh, uh, which, so here you have bodies, large number of machines made of extremely minute parts. Um, and again, if you look at its scale, right, in biology, in biology, and I showed that already on that first slide, you have things that, you know, range from, um, you know, molecules, biomolecules, cells, tissues, organs, all the way up to the size of the body. And there are these amazing, you know, 
capabilities in cells that we have just don't even fully understand yet how that, how that happens. And so sensing, information processing, actuation, protein expression, and transport. And so much of design and engineering is actually trying to mimic biology and learn from biology. And that's really the frontier moving forward. So all the young people in the audience, I think there is a tremendous opportunity at this interface with sort of biology, medicine, and engineering. Um, tons and tons to be done. So we are interested in this sort of scale of cells to tissue uh, and see what we can build using engineering approaches. So, uh, so the idea is if you're trying to think about a biological machine, um, well, there might be two ways to do it. Um, maybe you can think of a more of a developmental biology approach, which is what happens, I guess, in nature already. So you take cells and you, um, you know, um, cells, let's say, are fertilized or something you know, happens to cells, they start growing, and then you have, uh, in this case, for example, anybody seen this video before? Let's see if I can come pull it up. So this is the developing embryo of a zebrafish, and it's, this video is online, you can look at it, but essentially, um, <clears throat> over a period of many hours, you can see this very complicated, very intricate, amazing processes that take place that are happening during development and, and um, you know, shapes are being formed. So morphogenesis is a big mystery in biology and a big mystery in sort of design. How does shape form? Where is that information encoded? And eventually, of course, then, you know, the system that results is... Um, Right, so eventually then you end up with a zebrafish in this case. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to close that. And then you end up with this, right? So, so that's an amazing process. So can we think about taking cells and, for example, differentiating them into three different cell types that I mentioned earlier? Can we take cells and differentiate them into muscle cells or neurons or endothelial cells? And then think about putting them together uh, using fabrication approaches, using approaches where we can print and fabricate structures with cells. For, so, for example, here can we then make layers of cells of different types uh, and study and learn how they interact and then end up with some sort of a system also that, that can do some function. So um, that's the idea, and I think um, <clears throat> it's really kind of limited to our imagination, the kind of things that you could do with this potentially. So... Um, you know, you can think about, of course, developing organ mimics for drug, sense, for drug uh, testing. That's a big, big challenge. Um, you can think about miniature biological sensors and actuators, or call them biorobots, or things like that, that, you, that can sense and respond, that can clean up the environment. Um, implantable systems in the body for drug sensing, synthesis and release that are all biological. If you knew how to put cells together, you can create hyper organs that could do very important functions in the body. So there's a lot of very, very sort of open areas in this case, and we believe this is, you know, one of the frontiers in the future. Um, so in our center, we're actually trying to do some very primitive things, and I'll show you some examples, some very basic things that try to look at some very basic functions. So two projects that are ongoing is, can we build a structure that walks on a surface in a fluid? Can we just build something that is all biological that can move? Because movement and generation of force is one of the most basic functions that, that is needed. Uh, so something that walks or something that swims. So I'll talk about uh, mainly this walking kind of function. Can we make something that mimics an inchworm and can actually move on a surface? Uh, or can we fabricate something that swims? So actually a colleague of ours here, Professor Tahir Saif in mechanical engineering, he's working on these swimmers. And our group, uh, again, with collaboration with lots of people, uh, both, both groups, um, we're working on these walkers. So I'll show you examples of that. And the idea is very simple. Can you just fabricate a structure that walks or swims directionally? And maybe the first generation is not responsive to anything. And then you can add additional functionality over time, as I'll show you. Okay? So can we build something that walks on a surface, has a couple of actuators, right, biological actuators that are driven by cells, uh, has some shape, and then uh, it might have multiple sort of actuators, and it might have, uh, that are made of muscles, uh, it might have a neuronal circuit, maybe a little circuit, maybe even just as simple as a toggle switch, something that's a high and a low. So it senses something, 
and starts moving, and it senses something else and stops, for example. If you can really design something like that, that would be quite amazing in, with all biology, right? And then if the size gets larger than a couple of maybe centimeters, then you might need a vasculature system to exchange the nutrients and waste to keep the cells alive. So that's where, so we use uh, 3D printing for that. So 3D printing is actually a really cool technology that can be used for lots of useful things. Um, how many of you have heard about 3D printing? I think pretty much everybody, right? And I hope lots of students have actually done it and used it. We have some great examples on campus, right, with the Fab Lab, and you can actually go and see it and use it, and now you can build your own 3D printers. And so <clears throat> what we have done is, um, and actually let me then pass these things around. So this, be careful with, this is actually fluid. It's just water, so there's nothing dangerous here, but there's fluid, so don't break it. And inside, there's different 3D printed structures that are made with hydrogels that are the same material um, as your contact lens, for example. They're biocompatible. And that's the materials we use to print these structures with cells. So I'll pass these. Um, and there's different shapes. If you look closely, you're going to see they are kind of they are transparent, I meaning it's a transparent polymer, but you can see the edges. Um, and there's different shapes. So there's actually a chess rook is one of the classic things everybody prints. So you can see a chess rook with a staircase inside uh, and then other little things. So you can pass that around. Be careful again, it's liquid, but it's completely safe. There's no cells in this. I couldn't bring living cells, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so what we can do is actually print all sorts of stuff. So whatever you can think of a in a CAD drawing, you can actually go print in these. So what we have done that's different here is to actually use biocompatible materials. So we can use this polyethylene glycol, these materials that are biocompatible. Uh, so this is the, you know, you have a shape and you can print it. This is like two centimeters, so it's about this big. Uh, this is about a centimeter, you know, it has these uh, structures and you can replicate that in, in PEG. And there's lots of optimization here to, do, to be done to make sure that you can replicate the shape and, 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 the, and the material properties, the stiffnesses and things like that. So again, this is a busy slide, but if you just look at this, so we can actually also print um, organ models. And that, by the way, is a very interesting direction in itself. We are working with um, the hospital in Peoria, San Francis Hospital. Some of you might have heard about this partnership called Arches between Peoria and um, University of Illinois, uh, where the idea is to develop uh, technologies to train um, the healthcare professionals. And that is going to have a very important implication back in our future med school. But uh, the idea of developing new technologies. So what surgeons want to do is they want to take the, your images of your organs, right, and be able to, in almost real time, within the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes of that, replicate it, 3D print the organ, and then be able to look at it and, and, and plan for surgery. So it would be, you know, very organs, I mean, very patient-specific, and you can, they can uh, plan the surgery and then go in and do the process and do the surgery. So this, for example, is a, a model of a heart that's uh, four, centimeter, uh, four, four millimeters in this case. So this is half a centimeter. So it's a tiny heart. Uh, but this is too small. Um, there are new uh, netologists here uh, over there that actually want uh, models of hearts of babies. So you do imaging. You make this part, and then they can actually then section the part, and you can see how it is, and then go and plan your surgery. So there's that whole direction for 3D printing where you can try to make organ mimics that are very real in material properties and function that helps the physicians for training and for planning of procedures. But what we've also done is uh, <coughs> uh, taken um, 3D printers and actually then incorporated cells with them. So we can, we can print these materials and but embed living cells in them. So we can bring in solutions with cells and we can make layers of cells of different types and print these 3D structures also. So here, there is a, this is an actual image here on the right. This is that stack of cells, about a, you know, 500 uh, microns thick each layer. There's red cells, green cells, red cells. We can stack different cells, cell types, and make these 3D structures. Um, so uh, I try to just kind of skip through it, but so one of my PhD students a few years ago, we came up with this process to make a biological actuator. So we 3D print these structures in hydrogels. This is a top view. Essentially, there is a base and a little cantilever, and then we, in this case, what we, the cells that power the system are actually cardiac cells. So we extract um, cardiac cells from neonatal rats. So these are living cells. You extract them and you seed them. You seed the cardiac cells on these structures, and then 
I can skip through it. You can, but you can, the point is you can make these shapes and structures. You can design them. So that's what's interesting here. As a mechanical engineer, you can actually design these things and then go build them with these soft polymers and add cells to them. And then um, after, so these cardiac cells, after about three days, they actually uh, synchronize and they start beating in a, in a sheet. Okay, I hope now. Sorry. Okay, this better work. This is the highlight of the whole thing. <laughs> okay. So this particular one, you can see, so it's about 70 millimeters wide. You're looking at a cross section. And we fabricated it so that there is kind of two actuators or two legs or two anchors. One is this long one and a short one. And this is kind of a base that provides this asymmetry. So in this case, the cells are seated right over here on this side. And this actuator is, again, uh, made of um, uh, polyethylene glycol. So the cardiac cells start beating and they produce enough force to move the structure. So the structure actually then moves on its own. But as you can see, it's not going anywhere. And in this case, it's because the structure wasn't designed and optimized properly. Uh, these, uh, the stiffness is too high, the, the leg is too thick and stuff like that. So we uh, made different designs. And then there is one here then. So this one, the cells are seated on this structure. And this one is designed so that it produces enough force, and it actually kind of hops across a petri dish. So this is, it'll keep moving and walking from one end to the other end, and kind of get stuck. It doesn't turn around yet. We wanted to turn around actually. <laughs> that's that's the that's the big goal. That's a couple of PhD students right there. So, um, but the idea that this is again, you know, you can see it with your naked eye. Um, they look uh, and feel um, like living entities, uh, and they at this point perform very very primitive functions, which is just movement. Right, and this is, this is another one. Um, it's got actually these two anchor points. One is here and one is here. The cells are seated on this side. Um, and uh, again, this actually moves also in one direction. And in this case, it's spontaneous beating. So it's cardiac cells. You can extract them and from animals. And if you put them in the right condition, they'll actually um, you know, synchronize and start beating. So this is interesting. What can we do next in terms of adding more functions to it? So by the way, these things then, in terms of actual speed, you can, they can actually move 7 to 8 millimeters, which is about their body length, in 30 seconds. So you can see them in real time moving across, essentially, you know, slowly, uh, across, uh, um, uh, let's say, a petri dish or something in fluid. Right. <clears throat> OK, so well, we want to, of course, improve it, and we want to control the motion. So well, what happens in, in, in biology and, or in, uh, in us is actually skeletal muscle cells are the ones, not cardiac. Cardiac cells, of course, you know, make, make up the heart. But skeletal muscle cells are the ones that actually uh, you can control. And you have a neuromuscular junction, essentially. So you have neurons that would come, and then there is essentially a physical, you know, so there's the bone. Uh, typically, you have, you have the bone. Um, you might have a joint, and then there is a skeletal muscle cell, and there are tendons. So the skeletal muscle cell is what then actuates, and it moves the bones. Essentially, that's how our hands and our legs move, right? So inspired by that basic design, we can actually fabricate something like that, where you have a material here that has a low stiffness or can bend. You have these higher stiffness tendon-like legs. And then you, can you create a muscle cell, a skeletal muscle strip, uh, that connects those two structures, for example. So again, two very, very bright students, Carolyn and Ritu. Um, so they came up with this process for the 3D printing, where we can now fabricate those structures. They take the cells with the right matrix, mix it up, and they can actually fabricate. What you can look at is just these last two images, basically. This is um, those two legs sticking upside down, and the base is the bottom. But there's a solution here. You can see it kind of you know, coming off, sticking to, the, to these legs. And this is a cell matrix, cells with the, with the matrix. Uh, and this is a, you can actually, after it's all done, you can pick it up. And this is a cross section. So this is the beam. That's the, the two uh, tendon-like structures. And this whitish thing is actually a muscle strip that we can grow, essentially. So we can grow and form this muscle strip that connects those two legs. Uh, and this is actually a video over uh, many hours. I think it's 12 hours. And this is a very interesting process. It's an emergent process where what you see here is, so what we do is just put cells, skeletal muscle cells with a matrix. And essentially, over a period of 12 hours and longer, the cells aggregate. And they form this very well-defined muscle strip within this matrix 
So you can see it all aggregating. And in this structure right here, you're looking at a top view. So this structure is that leg sticking up, the tendon-like structure. And then this was the base. And you can see the three, sort of the features because it was 3D printed. So it, keeps, it actually produces some ridges. Um, and then all of these blackish type things, actually the cells in the matrix mix together. So it, it sort of self-aggregates and forms a structure. And an artist's rendition of this in three dimension would be something like this. So we have the two essentially tendon-like structure. There is this backbone or the back, uh, the back beam, call it, that is, that is not very stiff and can bend. And then we can create this muscle strip that's all biological that connects us to. <clears throat> So, uh, and these structures also, now skeletal muscle cells uh, will not self-beat. Uh, they have to be stimulated. So the simplest way to stimulate them is to apply electric field. So if you actually put two electrodes right here shown, that's this platinum electrode, and apply a voltage, um, the uh, cells will actually respond to that voltage, and they will, they will contract. Um, and this is a well-known fact. Um, so we actually do that to test these out. So what you're seeing here is a top view. Uh, again, this blackish layer is a biological muscle strip. And then the other two, these two regions are uh, those uh, legs, call it. And in this case, when we apply a field at one hertz, you can see the structure respond. And we have designed it to now walk in one direction. And this is at two hertz, so it's faster. And you can see the response is a little bit faster. And at four hertz also, it's actually responding. So it's responding and it can move. And now this thing responds to electric fields. So that's interesting. And now you have one other level of sort of control of these structures. Right? Now, we are not happy with that. We want more, more ways to control it. So well, uh, how many of you have heard of optogenetics? Anyone has heard of? So a few. So opto and genetics. So opto is light. And genetics is the idea of actually, again, using uh, this transfection process to introduce these channels that are light sensitive. So you create these light gated ion channels. And this is, I mean, widely used now in neuroscience, especially to control and actuate neuron or fire, get, get, get neurons to fire just by light rather than electric fields. Um, and it's very powerful technology. <clears throat> so we can also introduce those channels in these muscle cells. Um, so channel rhodopsin is one channel and which responds to blue light, essentially. So you shine blue light. And it opens up these channels, exchanges the ions, and the muscles can actually be activated. Uh, you can also do this with heterodopsin and with, with yellow light, um, which is then inhibitory. So, um, so let me uh, show you this a little bit here. So this is actually just on a surface of a, of a Petri dish. Um, and um, here we uh, are going to you know, pulse the light at one, one second, essentially. So you shine light, and you see the muscles move, right? So shine light, and those muscles move. So this is in a two dimension, just as for characterization. Um, then this one right here, same thing. Where's my little cursor? Oops, sorry. So this is at uh, half a second, 500 milliseconds, and you can see, you know, it shine light, and it responds. And then this one is even faster, hopefully. So this one, it will start doing it soon. Right here. So you shine light, and it responds to light. So you can get these muscles to respond to light. And that can be very interesting, because you can think about you know, creating structures that move with light. There's actually been papers reported, very exciting paper that came out, where they're trying to pace the heart with light. <laughs> um, so, so we actually then made structures our structures with these muscle, with these uh, tra um, optically um, transfected, and these then you can see a cross section, and then with every you shine the light, and uh, this this entire layer here is that muscle strip, um, and this is responsive to light, and you, it can generate enough force to then also create this motion. So now we can control these things with light and actually start and stop, which before we couldn't do. So that can also enable um, lots of things. And you can model these things. Um, you know, we, we um, are showing lots of the details. There's lots of optimization. Uh, you can figure out how to do some mechanical modeling and how, under what conditions this thing will move. Um, and then here is one which actually has um, two sets of muscles. So there is one here and one here. And again, you shine light, and it can move in one direction. 
Uh, this thing actually is bidirectional. You can shine light on different parts and have it move in different directions. We're trying to further characterize that and get that to work really well. But the idea would be to shine light and get it to move in different directions and be able to control the motion. So, um, and then you can actually even uh, get these things to, if you shine light on parts of it, then it should tilt, it should turn, and stuff like that. So you can do interesting things like that. Uh, whereas this one right here, you can see sorry, that um, you're seeing it kind of at an angle, but you shine light on parts of it and you see it turning. So it's actually going to, you know, it was here and now it's turning this way. So you can get these things to turn and kind of control. Like. So I think <clears throat> there's some very interesting possibilities. And again, we see this as developing the basic tools and the basic modules. And then, you know, have then lots of the people think about how to, and, and, and ourselves, but essentially it's very basic modules that are now all biological, that weren't available. So we have the design rules for this, we have the shapes, we have the processes, we have recipes, and students can use it. We actually, I'll show you later, we are now teaching this in classes and stuff like that, where people can think about um, designing all sorts of actuators of different designs, essentially, that are all biological and soft. Of course, the next level of functional improvement would be, would be what? Would be uh, to try to have sort of a processor that controls it, right? So how can we then integrate neurons with this? And how can we form sort of a neuromuscular junction? Um, so, um, so you have neurons, and there are motor neurons, and these motor neurons connect to muscles, and the muscles then are, you know, actuated. That's how kind of it works in biology. So can we replicate that? So there's actually a lot of groups also trying to form these in vitro neuromuscular junctions, essentially neuromuscular junctions on a chip or on a surface or in 3D, where then you can also study those for, uh, for example, for drug screening applications. There are specific drugs or specific toxins that might attack only the neuromuscular junction. If you can replicate that controllably, that can be very useful for lots of applications. So what you see here is some preliminary results. Uh, these are what's called embroid bodies that are, that are um, a bunch of neurons pulled together, essentially, different types of cells pulled together. And we can now work, we are working on growing these on muscle strips and trying to see if we can make these connections between muscles and neurons and eventually get this thing to be controlled by neurons. So here you see these um, very nice pictures of these neurite extensions. So uh, there are glia cells here. All this blue are basically nuclei of different cell types, but these are green are actually processes, neurons are giving out processes that are going through, that are going, um, and um, you can see this in 3D and things. So, that, so the idea now is to try to see if we can control the placement and the formation of this neuromuscular junction and, and move that forward. So um, those are kind of things that we're thinking about in terms of basic units, the actuators, uh, biological actuators, trying to control them with, with light, with electric field, with neurons, and then uh, there is also then other people in the team. Uh, Steve Stice is part of our center. Um, he, along with others here on our campus, Martha Gillette and other faculty members, they're thinking about how to build a neural circuit. So maybe some sort of a toggle switch. If you can put neurons, specific types of neurons in specific locations, you can make a, a circuit and have that connect to the muscles. And you can have a system that can sense a chemical and respond, essentially. Our goal is to be able to then also have cells integrated that can respond and produce some, let's say, chemicals that neutralize a toxin, for example. So there's many applications that you can think about um, along that direction. So, um, so I talked about uh, muscles, I talked a little bit about neurons. Let me also talk a little bit about the vasculature piece, the idea of the blood vessel formation and patterning, and kind of give you some examples of that. So there's lots of actually work going on in that direction also. And again, that, that uh, has also applications in, in, in biology and medicine. So if you can actually come up with a way to pattern or grow, form blood vessels, that is very, very important right? uh, for many medical applications. So here, in collaboration with Professor Jun Kong here in chemical engineering, we created this a 3D printed patch, what we call a, a living microvascular stamp. So essentially, this is about a centimeter on a side, a patch um, that is made with this polymer again that's biocompatible, and we can introduce cells in it. So there are these fibroblasts that are encapsulated within this matrix, and we can 3D print this. And the idea here is that the cells would release growth factors, 
And if you put this on a tissue, on, a, on an existing living tissue, the cells produce growth factors. The cells are like factories of these chemicals that produce growth factors. And we produce these patterns in this case. So just simple holes. These are just through holes. And these holes then provide um, a spatial control of the release of those growth factors. So you can release them where you want by forming these holes. And, um, um, and that could be then used to actually see if we can form or pattern or regrow blood vessels. So uh, we tested this in these chick embryos. This is a pretty standard sort of model for looking at vasculature formation, also used for drug screening related to vasculature. So this is a chick embryo. You can see the surface here. It's got all these blood vessels. So what we do is um, we actually put this patch on this chick embryo. Uh, so you open up the shell, you put the patch, and then you close it, and then you wait a week or so and after a week, you go in and you can remove the patch. And then when you remove the patch, you see something very interesting. For the right size of the patch and dimensions, you can actually, this is blood vessels that have been patterned precisely by the features that were on the patch. So the patch had these holes and squares. And essentially, you can see that the blood vessels are formed mapping the edges of that structure. So this is very interesting because then you can possibly direct blood vessels where you want or where the patch is, uh, or create very fine geometry that you might need for organs that need a high vascular density. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. And actually, there's a lot of work behind it where the features, where the size of this patch matters and all these things. So um, we actually try to write letters here. You, so you can actually you know, form specific features and patterns within the, within the embryo uh, in this case. Uh, but. Um, so the idea is, of course, the clinical application here, as you can imagine, is for cardiac. And we are working very actively on it with Professor Jun Kong and Larry Shook. Here is some preliminary data that was very exciting, where this patch was then, so Larry Shook's group developed this animal model. Um, and here is the patch on the heart um, of a rat. And you put this patch, close it. And then we actually saw some very interesting results. This is for a myocardial infarction only, the ejection fraction and the stroke volume, which are the two parameters that are measured for a function of heart. Um, so there's a blank. Um, but then you can see that this is with low cell density, high cell density, and this is a healthy animal. So no myocardial, in, I mean, uh, so there's no, my, uh, no myocardial infarction. And then here, when we put the patch back on with low or high cell density, we can recover the function um, almost to the healthy range. And this is stroke volume. Essentially, again, you can see a healthy and then a low cell density and a high cell density within the patch, essentially. So the idea here would be that if you can do this someday, lots of still challenges, but soon after the myocardial infarction, can we deliver this patch um, using a catheter, essentially? So the thing is rolled up, and can you deliver it locally right where the, let's say, where the injury happened on the heart and place it there? within, you know, soon after the infarction, and then it can then help generate blood vessels um, that can help uh, minimize the damage, at least. And then uh, also, let me just show this last. So this is uh, actually from Roger Cam's group, our collaborator at MIT. Um, he's also working on his vasculature on a chip. So they've come up with a way to, within a chip, form this artificial vasculature, basically. So you take those endothelial cells, that we had put in in the patch, so you know, they can take these endothelial cells, mix it with other matrix, and then form these blood vessels. And what you see moving are actually beads. These are just cell-sized cell beads that they introduced on one end. And then the beads can go through those you know, blood vessels that have been formed. And you can see them moving through uh, these artificial blood vessels on a chip. So there's a lot of work that's also happening in vasculature. And again, many of these things have much more direct, immediate applications in drug screening and biomedical applications. So <clears throat> there's a lot of, I mean, I hope I you know, gave you some examples which just kind of really provoke the imagination and the possibilities. Um, you know, where are we headed, where are we, where are we going, uh, and where we are. So we have, we have developed these three generations of I would call biological actuators, you know, cardiac cell driven, uh, muscle cell with light, electric fields, um, complex geometry. We're trying to work on neuronal control. Maybe someday integrate vasculature within those muscle strips. Um, can we think about structures that self-repair? Now, these are living cells. 
Can you engineer some sort of self-repair functions? Can we think of some sort of an exoskeleton that you know, protects them from the outside and things like that? So, um, and lots of very interesting possibilities. Um, these organs are what we would call hyper-organs, you know, unique functions that you can engineer in that are used for implants and drug delivery, high-throughput screening, um, you know, surveillance, sort of lots of you know, futuristic applications. Um, very, very important, right? There is some very important ethical considerations here. Uh, and of course, I'm sure everybody started thinking of it as soon as I started to present this stuff. So we, we take that very seriously, and we, and we talk about this a lot within our center with students. So you know, at what level of complexity does this biological machine become a living organism? Um, what features distinguish one from the other? Um, and these questions are no different than what people talk about in synthetic biology, where they're trying to design cells and microbes and different things that can do useful functions. So we're also thinking about that as just another level of complexity, where now you can also start to give it specific shapes and specific functions. Um, and actually, we have developed these different ethics modules, we call it. They're online. You can go look at them and go through them. There's actually scenarios and questions and and at least the idea is to think, be thinking about this from the day one, have these discussions with students to make sure that we do things that are, of course, useful while still enabling the technology forward. Um, <clears throat> there's also a lot of very interesting outreach and sort of getting kids excited about this. So if you, how many of you have come to the engineering open house before? Maybe some, maybe all the kids, good. So you can come again next year in March, and this is uh, Brian Williams, who's a trainee in, this, in our center, uh, in this uh, NSF center. He's actually built these himself. He's, he does this in biology, but he also builds these in the macro scale to at least get the idea across of what we're trying to do. So here, this is uh, actually kind of mimics our first one in some ways, but it's just air powered. And then this actually, he built this whole thing up himself, just by taking parts that are off the shelf and you shine light. It was trying to show this idea of optogenetics control. So he takes a laser pointer, shines light, and you can get these things to move, of course. So um, that's pr uh, very useful. And then we do lots of also outreach in terms of talking to people about it. I don't know how many of you have been to the, some of the nano um, and EBIX uh, uh, exhibits over at the farmer's market. And uh, Brian today. Brian today thank you very much. Brian is doing that today, exactly. So you can go straight from here to there and actually see his. So we have lots of our students that are actually, so here's Brian. Um, and uh, other students. So uh, I think, and actually, so most recently this semester, so Ritu is one of my PhD students. She's just fantastic. So she actually did this. I just facilitated it. So she actually helped develop a lab module that is now being introduced in a, in a bioengineering course um, where you actually learn about biocompatibility. You learn about transfection of that optogenetics part and 3D cell culture, and then you build a walker, essentially students can design whatever structure they like, and they can put those cells on and measure, so they can model, measure, characterize, and improve sort of the engineering workflow, <laughs> model, you know, uh, design, uh, measure, characterize, and, and kind of go through that cycle. So they can actually do that with, with these kind of structures uh, using, using uh, 3D printing. And then I just want to put a plug in for our, you know, all of you have heard about this College of Medicine also. So anyway, I think this, what I showed here in the later part is certainly much, few, much further up. But those are kind of things that are possible in the future as we bring together all of these technologies and try to see how they can actually make an impact in biology and medicine to better, to better lives. So um, I want to thank my group, uh, a, a fantastic set of individuals, um, uh, master's, PhD students, postdocs. We have funding from lots of different places. I mainly talked about the EBIX work. And then I want to also show my faculty collaborator list, which is a long list. So all these areas are highly interdisciplinary. We collaborate with lots of people. It's all team science. You have to bring people together. They have to have their disciplinary depth, but then you bring them together, and hopefully they can work together to do bigger things in a team. Um, and then, of course, you know, three of my kids that <laughs> keep me motivated and keep, keep me moving forward. And uh, with that, I'll stop, and I can take questions. Thank you. <laughs> So it's a very good question. So the, the how do you keep the cells alive? So uh, that's one of the biggest challenges, uh, which I, of course, conveniently glossed over. 
So you have to, we are using mammalian cells here, and these all need 37 degrees C, like body temperature, and the right fluids around. So this is all uh, at either 37 degrees C or at room temperature, they can survive for a certain amount of time. But they all have to be in fluid. And the fluid then has the media which has their food. So essentially glucose and sugars and different media, uh, I mean different components in the solution. So you have to provide the solutions and the food for the cells to keep them alive. And you have to exchange that every so often uh, if you want to keep a long-term culture. So that's exactly where the vasculature comes in someday, that if you had a circulatory system that exchanges the nutrients and the waste, then you can keep these things going for a much longer period of time, and you won't have to introduce or exchange the medium. Yes, please. Isn't there a possibility, especially on the bacterial level, et cetera, of possibly developing something that could be highly detrimental? So so let me just repeat the question. So the question is, uh, is it possible to be on the bacterial level that you could develop something highly detrimental? That's a very good question, and I think that's exactly the challenge that we face in any of these fields that are also related to sort of engineering with biology. So uh, we hope, and th I think that's where you have to keep talking about it. Uh, every technology we hope will be used for useful and helpful things. That is very important. How it might be misused is something that we really have to try to manage and uh, talk about it, put regulations around it, monitor it, the kind of things that are ongoing. This was a big controversy, uh, of course, at the viral level, at the DNA level, at the bacterial level. It's been a controversy for some time. There was a big controversy recently where, uh, you know, for these viruses, right, that w so the idea that if you give out exactly how these were re-engineered, you could also, you could, you could give those processes and techniques to somebody who can misuse them. So it is a very uh, important discussion, and I think it has to be regulated. But how do you do that worldwide? Um, Politics is going to enter into it. Uh, it seems like to me it'd be extremely difficult to fully control. Yes, please. Your machines are way short of self replicating, though, right? Yes, yes. I mean, yeah. You didn't even mention self replicating. That's, we can't even imagine. So you're way far away from life. Very, 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 very far away. <laughs> exactly. Right now, the goal is to uh, build you know, these sensors that can sense and respond and things that actually help with medical applications, yeah, exactly. Question. Yes, please. Um, can you find new genes with all these machines? Can you like, take a drop of blood? Can oh, you find new genes? Yes, that's a very good question. So the, he's asking a question about the first part of the talk, that can you take a drop of blood and find specific genes? So yes, we are working on that. And uh, the idea there is to also, you can look for new genes or specific genes that are indicative of specific diseases. So for example, when someone gets cancer, you have a tumor that's growing somewhere and the tumor sheds DNA and genes in the blood. And can you take blood, a drop of blood and look for that gene and that can become a diagnostic for cancer. So that's a very good question. Yes. Given that we're right and left, do you use a mirror imaging, especially like with a light actuation? <coughs> do you use like a mirror imaging where you take one side of the body and you teach the other to get the other side to function off of it? So that's a very good question. I think also a little further away, but that's so the hope is that you can have the neuronal circuits that can learn somehow or adapt. Uh, so we're not we're far from that. Tr we're we're far from that right now exactly. But the idea would be to have then structures that have some. Uh, so, so actually, you know, when, when um, uh, something walks or moves in one direction, there has to be some asymmetry. If all the forces are applied completely symmetric, you don't go anywhere. <laughs> You're just going to sit there and, and, and just beat. So you have to have asymmetry. Uh, but then the idea would be to have a symmetric structure, but then produce the force locally in an asymmetric way. So you can have the same structure go this direction or this direction if the force is produced asymmetrically. So that's what we're trying to work on. What if instead of 3D printing them, you actually like wrote your own genes like using a computer simulation? Right, so it's a very good question. Uh, there are people actually thinking about that and doing that. So we are, the stuff I showed was actually at a much larger scale, uh, right? Uh, we are trying to print materials uh, and then put cell, existing cells in it and maybe re-engineering the cells. But there are people that are, um, you know, there are groups and there are people and there have been publications on creating a synthetic genome. 
So uh, you can actually, there are actually companies that you can order DNA sequences. We do that all the time for other projects. So you want to, you know, you, if you know the sequence of a gene um, and you want to do experiments to try to detect it, build a sensor, you need to create a model system, you can order it from companies. You go in on the website and you give them the gene sequence and they'll ship it to you in two days. And the longest gene that currently you can get uh, commercially is maybe about 300, you know, base, bases long, something three to 400 maybe. But there are people trying to build longer genomes and then the idea is that you put those genomes into a structure that then can translate and transcribe to form the proteins. And so there are people thinking about building life from the bottoms up that way. Can you build central pattern generators? Sorry, can you? Can you build central pattern generators? Cent oh, thank you, CPG, yes. So can you build, so the question is, can you build central pattern generators, which are the basic sort of, I would call it, basic elements in the nervous system. So that's exactly what a group in our center is trying to model and work on. The idea is to replicate and build a CPG <laughs> central pattern generators, uh, which are clusters of neuron connected to each other that can then keep firing and then you connect those off to muscles. So that's exactly that toggle switch that I talked about would be a CPG. That's the, that's the hope. Yes, please. Is there any way to use like plants? That's a very good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. So I showed, uh, there was one line in the application of smart plants. Um, so you picked up on that. So um, there's no, so actually we made our lives a little difficult by picking mammalian cells to work with. Uh, actually, uh, insect cells and plant cells can live in whatever room temperature. So there is actually a lot of interesting work and, uh, in terms of trying to print plants or print things that are plant-like. There's no reason you couldn't do that. As a matter of fact, NASA is very interested in something like that and even printing food. So 3D print, you take the elements and you print the food for these long-term space flights. But uh, if you can get, if you can, you know, form shape and use biological components, that's, you know, the possibilities are really endless. Yes, please, in the back. Yes. Oh. I'm sorry? You worry about the forest like a gene transfer to a strong environment? That's a pretty, yeah, uh, no, I guess no, right now we're not worrying about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're doing anything uh, that, that, the, yeah, that, that really relates to that per se. We're not really perturbing anything at that scale. It's a very important question, but no, I think we are far from, yeah. Please, Ben. I went to a home lecture a couple of years ago, and they talked about how things move within the cell, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the motion of how do you get nutrients around the cell, and I think there are two motions. One is the foot to foot, and the other one is the inch one, which I saw up here. Can you consult with those guys? So, yeah, so those are actually actual motor proteins that are working inside the cell. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So those are at much smaller scales. We are certainly getting inspiration from it, but again, the scale here is a little bit b much, much bigger. Those, but but uh, yeah, there is inspiration that we can get from that to try to build these other st synthetic structures. Yeah, those, those things, yeah, they're very smart inside the cells. They're just amazing how they move back and forth on the, <laughs> exactly, on the cytoskeletal structures and then the transport cargo across and yes. There's a whole universe inside a cell. <laughs> Have you been approached to look at uh, inexpensive early detection of Alzheimer's disease? So it's a very good question. Uh, we have been thinking about that, yeah. I, so I think for Alzheimer's, as far as I know, I know very little actually, so I should be very careful saying, uh, but, but I think the markers, early markers are not really very well known, and maybe there's other experts in the f here that can tell me that, but so if you had a marker, so we are not necessarily uh, discovering the markers, but right. if we can discover a marker, we can, det we can detect it. I think the technology is not just in my group, but other groups on campus and you know, colleagues, uh, we're, we have a suite of technologies for early detection of proteins, DNA, uh, metabolites, and cells. And so if there's a marker that's known, I think we can detect it. So for Alzheimer's, the markers is not well known yet. This, people are trying to find genes for it also, right? Early, yeah. But a blood-based marker or something like that is, I don't think it's so known you, yet. You haven't been approached yet? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned um, <coughs> regeneration. And I was wondering, how close are you to dealing with, with for example, the remyelinization 
of neural pathways, which is um, incumbent on um, MS and other neurological diseases? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, I think, I mean, we are, our group is not working on that directly. Um, but we are thinking about this sort of self-repair now in terms of mechanical self-repair. So one of, um, actually we are, that's one of our next projects is to see how we can have these structures and, and actually see if we can embed certain cell types or certain other functionalities that if there's any physical damage, it could repair it. Um, and there are ways, there are, I think, interesting ways to do that. There's actually experts on campus here on self-healing soft materials, at all, all you know, soft materials that can self-heal or materials that can self-heal. So we're trying to learn from that and also learn from biology how things heal and seeing if we can come up with some way to do it in these structures. So that's a very loaded question also. There's a whole field. There's, there is a lot of people working on sort of silencing gene as a means to do therapy. That's actually is, a, is, a, is, an, is an approach being worked on. We're not doing that, but there are people on campus and other around the country working on actually silencing specific genes for that. Um, what you mentioned about Down syndrome, that actually is a, yeah, a topic very, very close to and dear to my heart personally also. But um, uh, yeah, there's actually, there's been two or three papers in that space now. There was a Nature paper just two years ago where somebody was able to show that you can silence the entire extra chromosome, essentially. Uh, and it was only in cell lines at this point, and the cells were still viable. So I think there's beginning work starting to, starting to come out. It's very early work in that space also. There's a mouse model, yeah, for Down syndrome actually that exists. Uh, how, how does your research relate to stem cell research? I mean, it seems like it's kind of going on a parallel path of sorts. So, uh, yeah, so in our center, we, we have actually people that are stem cell experts. Um, and we, I mean, uh, my group is not working on stem cell differentiation per se, but we use existing protocols. We're not developing new protocols. So we do do, um, you know, there are existing protocols for taking, um, um, you know, um, uh, mouse embryonic stem cells and turning them into motor neurons, for example. So we are using some existing protocols. We're not necessarily developing new protocols for stem cell. Um, so we're, we're relying on collaborators. I think we can only do so many things well. <laughs> So we're relying on collaborators to come up with ways to get the cell source. So we actually have people in our center that are experts as a cell source. Uh, and then we are using the cells in these structures to do these macro scale designs. Can you think of some examples? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I don't mean to. So I think, I think the idea is that it's really, we are thinking of it as, a, as building blocks at this point. And we like to do a demonstration of um, a structure that has neurons and muscles and be able to sense a chemical, um, glutamate or something, let's say sense something specific and then respond in terms of force production and be able to build some memory in it. That's what our goal is as a basic demonstration. Now, I, we think that I th you know, using those building blocks, I think you can think of designing lots of structures, lots of applications, if you can do some building blocks. Absolutely, exactly. Yeah, drug screening is the most immediate application. If you can recapitulate the basic functions of, let's say, muscles, neurons, and neuromuscular junctions, you can use it for drug screening. <clears throat> So uh, there is possibilities to exactly design and build. So there's a whole field of tissue engineering, right? People are trying to now use also this 3D printing to make uh, artificial organs to replicate, you know, essentially that. But then, you know, what we're trying to do, think about at least is how can we add other functions, right? Also novel functions to that. So yeah, it, there's lots of applications in implantable organs and devices uh, that are all biological that enhance function.
All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Illinois.